about this site. One is that we are really thankful to Barbara Bragudis and Robin McCardle, both of whom are part of Sculpture Tucson, who actually we don't even pay a rental fee for this site. Um, and they're very generous to let us have this. And even when necessary to move one or two of these sculptures that are around you. Although this is a temporary show, which will, um, I don't think, be here after the end of this year. So. And also, because of these sculptures here, which are here due to an agreement with um, basically the Mexican government, uh, please do not set your cups or, or glasses down on any of the sculpture pedestals. We try and be very protective of those. Usually when we have two readers, we don't have a break. The last time we, did, we had an event, we did. So let me check in with you and see how you're feeling after the first reader. What? Oh, we got one vote for break already. And, and then almost always we have a short, maybe 10 minutes, uh, question and answer session at the end, if anybody has a question. And, and we will probably ask both Lorraine and Paul to come up for that. I am introducing both of them, one at, one at a time, one later. Um, although I'm told by them that may, they may have other things to say about each other too, which is welcome. Lorraine Lupo is the author of The Unwanted Sounds from Cuneiform Press, By Way Of from Green Zone, and co-creator of Dust Exchange, Slack's Books, and Guy, A Fast-Paced Sad Story, which are both collaborations with the artist and architect Max Jacobson. Her work has appeared in the New England Review, 14 Hills, Across the Margins, and Art Practical, and elsewhere. She founded the now defunct, too many things are now defunct, but the now defunct Gallery Lux and edits the periodic postcard series. As Slack Books, she occasionally publishes chapbooks and she's an active member of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and she's poet in residence at the Creative Growth Art Center. In that capacity, she edited their first collections of poetry the poem is Telling Me I Remember and Dear Volcano. I have recently been reading the classic Chinese book of songs from a period 800 to 600 BC. They are marvelous and do just what I want a poem to do. That is, they claim a little space for what they want to present intimate an emotion within that space and possibly leave one with a question. No more is needed. I think this is just about what Lorraine Lupo's poems do. Like her take on a single extended moment in Castro Street, December 20th, 2016. Yellow mustard, Marques, you must. Remember this, eating a hot dog in the 20 minutes before the movie. Muni orange nail polish, strangers goodbyes, bright, beautiful underground train. I think we may find some of this Marque magic, the quiet kind and the bright kind, as we follow this train into Lupo's world. Please welcome Lorraine. <laughs> Um, I am so excited to be here in particular because um, I thought maybe I wouldn't be able to because I twisted my ankle really badly the night before I was supposed to fly out. So I might like sit down, but okay. I'm just so glad that I am standing. And maybe I should I? I'll start by. If you need to. I'll start by standing because I you feel need weird. To. So if you need to. Oh, if you need to. If you need. To. If you need to. Yeah. No. I'll, I'll, so anyway, and it's really exciting to see like all these faces of people I don't know because that doesn't always happen. 
like, right? Like you go to poetry readings, it's the same people all the time. Um, so I know there's like some new to poetry people in the audience, maybe even slightly hostile to poetry people in the audience. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so I'm just excited. So, and thank you, Charles. And we call it POG. Okay, and thank you to POG. And this space is so lovely, so all good. Um, so um, I'm going to start with something that we just decided I was going to start with because there are some younger people in the audience. So um, this is... Can I, can I to, can I ask you to talk more into the microphone? Oh, sure. I'm always Sorry, worried about being too here. loud and blasting people out of the... Oh, can you hear me now? That's better. Okay, okay. You missed all the times I was thanking people, but that's... <laughs> um, so uh, this is called for Kay, who's uh, my daughter, but tonight I'll dedicate it to the younger people. Um, I like eating pie with you, pumpkin, cherry, coconut cream. You like lemon meringue. The chocolate pie at Sweet Adeline's is the best, better even than my grandmother's, though they overdo it with the whipped cream, don't you think? I love you more than anything in the whole wide world, but you can't have my crust. <laughs> um, so uh, for a while, uh, Paul was like my only reader, um, which is like, you know, as a single reader goes, it's pretty great. So in addition to writing poems together, we were always giving each other prompts too. So I don't know if you remember giving me this title, but it was kind of a doozy. And, but it worked. I figured it out. I was part of it. Um, right, you were giving me a special challenge. So this title is um, Nay Plus Ultra. This is going to be the worst poem you've ever read. It smells like garbage. It isn't even ugly. Ugly is distinguished. This poem is a blob. It drools a stain on your silk shirt. It steals your thoughts. It makes you wince. It puts you to sleep then wakes you up again just as you were having a nice dream. Too bad, the poem has nothing to say. It is lazy and stupid. It makes you want to punch the poet. But the poet is elsewhere eating an expensive lunch and reading a better poem than the one you're reading. The poet chuckles with delight at an exceptional turn of phrase in the poem she's reading. It's original, so lovely. It leaves her grateful to have read it. But you're stuck with this poem. A sullen kid you have to babysit a heavy shoe that's giving you a blister, a stupid phrase of music that you can't get out of your mind. Why won't it end and release you from its mediocrity? How about a nice image or metaphor or even platitude? No rhyme or clever structure, no confession or nugget of truth. The only tree in this poem is the one the poet fell asleep under after her lunch. What content she shows for you, poor reader, who likes to read poems, such a person should be rewarded with a pat on the head or at least a word of thanks or an apology. After all, there are plenty of better things you could be doing than reading this poem. The plants need to be watered and the bills need to be paid. And isn't it just like this poem to remind you of all your obligations instead of allowing you the escape you were looking for? I told you this poem is bullshit. And frankly, I'm surprised you continue to read it. What kind of dope are you anyway that you let a poem abuse you while the poet is eating an oatmeal cookie and laughing at you? Come on, put him up. You're pathetic. Defend yourself. Oops, you lose. The poem is over. And it's all downhill from here. Okay, this one is called Portrait. The worst time of day in the worst part of the apartment and the nicest things are outside. The spiders are tired of looking down at your flat page, which you know is just a substitute for it to work. I'm not ready for it to work. Take these tulips dying in the vase, vulnerable aggressively. I'm a nice guy. I consider it bad luck to see the moon in daylight, flashing neon from my window. How can that word keep going? I blame optimism, default for genuine experience. Or, stop remembering, my advice. Like Fat Joe said, lean back. I didn't actually know who Fat Joe was, but the person that this is sort of about 
said that to me, and I was like, oh, that's great, I'll write it down. Um, anyway, appetites. There's no such thing as the thing you want. A guy on BART figured out how a hoodie can double his pants, but it's not what he wants. Is that logical enough? I needed a dupe, so did he. What happened? I went home and listened to some old messages, delusions mostly, on the edge of my chair. I can't choke myself, but oh, to be lifted and flung around the house. Wrong page, no, out. Romeo, don't touch me. Wash your hands first. Boys tag the overpass, breaking their necks. I've headed up to here with words, eating them off my plate. If you don't want permanence, why record it? Why do you keep calling? Juliet at the mirror to be more ethereal, her disorder. Dying is embarrassing, so noticeable. She opened the door and a broom hit her on the head. Kel lump. Oh, I got to blow my nose, pardon me. This is called sequence. <clears throat> The place I regret at the end of a flight of stairs. Cool glass the bugs bump against. Comprehension is misleading. A tremendous flock overhead, mutual agreement, rolling periphery. And many a great mind blows with the curtains out the window. I've tried to talk myself out of nothing butness, overusing the stationary machine up the viewless path. What kind of hill do you need? A form of faith that can't be beat. It will make its own sense, the way that trees do. By paying attention, a month passes. The hyacinths are up, toppling over from their own weight. Every creature has its private disaster, while you, raincoat over arm, hesitate at the brink of the broken escalator as if a greater phenomenon had stopped. One thing doesn't follow the next, according to the painting living out its fate on the wall. Piles of oranges set to fall. Oh, yeah, so uh, I, I was very jokingly mentioning that uh, we have a friend staying with us that is um, not necessarily hostile to poetry, but we were talking about the personal in poetry and so I was thinking, oh, should I read something that's like personal? So I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna read two personal things. One is baldly personal. And one I, I've always liked because it's the most personal thing I've ever written, but you can't tell. So now I'm telling the secrets out. Okay, Procession of the Innocents. All you babies won't last. Doze off and the golden year is past. Mine happened in another state, fell down the well. Goodbye, carrots in the garden. Emerging to no fanfare, unextraordinary like you, because I've done nothing wrong. Go ahead and cry. I can buy you a mockingbird. You're not tragic. I am. The Ballad of the Sad Young Men. All these sad young men think they know war. What I know isn't in history books. I don't want to fight anymore. I knew a baby and some sad young men who walked miles to get to me. I walked with them, behind sometimes. That's what I know. No, I don't know marks. I don't know how to shoot a gun. What is glory? My fights are in my head. I hate certainty. I'm jealous of your certainty. Maybe I should start charging money for this love. It feels like work. Did Marx have a wife? What kind of husband was Marx? I was alienated from my labor when my daughter was born. No one told me it was their hands inside my body pulling her out. 
Panicked, my voice rose. My husband snapped pictures of the wound. They took her away. That's what I know. When the fog rose through the trees and she was at my breast, I was worried I was doing something wrong. That was the happiest moment of my life. It's like a bummer to end on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, now I'm going to read from another thing that's related to Paul. Um, this is like a, a book length um, long poem that Paul published for me with his Breather Editions. Um, and it's called The Greatest Outdoors, A Loop. And I just kind of fell into this idea that it's, it can be read continuously. And then now I, when I read from it, I joke that if you ever just want to have one book in your life, it's this, because you just, any page, you pick it up, you read it forever for the rest of your life. You don't need to read another book. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to read a little bit from it. It's the preparator's job to fix the angle, then leave it alone, go outside, have a beer amongst strangers. The curator gave a talk in the gallery, but the artists were yelling, so not everyone could hear him. The preparator is hungry, which is a side effect of the medication he's taking. He mooches 10 bucks for a submarine sa sandwich, but it doesn't satisfy. He says, I'm just filling up space by way of explanation, but his buddy doesn't understand experiments and placement. The money is either in his pocket or not. Or were we speaking of the corporeal body? Yes, said the preparator, and he should know. Just last month, a wall fell on him and fucked up his shoulder. That doesn't prevent him from loving objects, almost like living things. The vase has a scene that continues round and round, like this day you're having, this time you're having reading, or whomever might be missing you right now, call them, because maybe they've forgotten and you need to remind them with the gentleness of your voice. That to be intentionally sequential is like a plumber, and we should disappear from life into an ordinary puddle. Is French rain idiotic? Is everything worth my attention? Yes, even this bad music. No, you've read this poem before. The rain describes something. 19th century crows, clinker bricks, or both simultaneously. Simple glue is never enough to keep the leaves from dropping into the gutter or the soggy bag from falling apart in the crosswalk, produce rolling to the wheels of parked cars. All is wasted. You're kidding yourself if you think this paper stacks up just because it has words on it. Even to yourself, these scribblings are unin unintelligible. And as for the crows, they are doing the same thing, like homework, never-ending homework. Now that teacher is dead, I can continue on whatever theme I like, which is dangerous, given our present cultural predilections. But the 21st century is where, unfortunately, I will reside forevermore, remembering his bemusement at the American predicament, a sentiment only accomplished by imminent death. Is this why he returned to Montaigne? Wait, we're all going to die. When is it premature to look forward to the after-dinner cigarette? I guess, after you've smoked it. It is no use. From the standpoint of a tree, you are an accomplice to murder. Faux serious so as to blend in, jarred sentiments, sophisticated cornichons of deconstruction while Rome burns. Um, and then I thought I would end with some new things. Um, let's see. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. This doesn't have a title quite yet. I was um, kind of messing around with repeating elements. You'll see. So right now, I just think of it as roses. The stair is a seat. So you'll you'll see. Um, the roses open their dark arms. The stairs, several answers, repeat. The rose, piece by piece, the rule that is the sea. 
No longer concerned with the predictable melody, boredom roses, trees, then stairs moving on a screen, sea disagreeing. We are open to these associations. A thing can be cliche and itself. You can't climb, fall down the sea, named severally as roses. Birds have no use for stairs or roses' expressions. Roses' delusions. Stairs that make you feel stupid. You don't know which legs to use. <laughs> I just don't know why it makes me think of you, even though, anyway. You don't know which legs to use. <laughs> not so the birds, who when they speak, it is not the truth, but just their version. Um, and then the next two are something that is just from a new project that I think is going to be a longer thing, so it doesn't have a title. But I was sort of curious about, I'm interested in, and I guess it came from reading, or reading I'm making, I'm dignifying it by calling everybody, watching so much television during the pandemic, we all did it, right? And you just become kind of immersed and almost drowning in those stories, and the blurring between our storytelling in our own uh, our own lives or whatever we're, we're telling ourselves about our lives. Anyway, that kind of mesh is sort of interesting to me. So we'll see. They wrote a story about themselves. Each page a false ending even nightfall could not conclude. She listened to the same song every day. The song is the story, is the stand-in, which is always temporary. And they answered to this temporality the way we all do, inventing further variations on the joy of making noise and the joy of silence and the strangeness of their real faces. This is the story they told themselves under cover of smoke and branches. And this story can fit into your hand, it is so small. It is so sad that it makes them cry. When they are alone, they recite how her face is so his voices, their hands clasping. These words pile up like leaves, and in the story, the wind picks them up. The wind isn't real, but it erases the less perfect in them. She is his talisman. He is her perfect secret, knowing there are no such things. She is part of the story where they open the drawer. He left the book on the bus. Someone steps off the bus in a hurry. That's the way the language goes, through chaos and back out again. She is the man in the song, his description in anybody. Do you know him? Do I know you? Their bond is an amnesia that informs everything. She knows he would answer to any name, but none are uncommon enough for love. Maybe it's only something in a book, the writer. Go ahead. The writer makes predictions. She says, I am known for not enjoying holding hands. So he takes her hand and holds it. And it turns into a paragraph, a remark just out of earshot, a train whistle that sounds like a tinkling piano in the next apartment. It is the hour where the seams start showing. They are taking the set down, but still believe in the imaginary circumstance, hungry for the verisimilitude of ourselves. Okay, one last poem, then I'm done. Where is it? Okay, I wrote this one for Paul. I mean, I wrote, I've written a lot of poems for Paul, but this is my most recent one, and I haven't even sent this to you. Um, and if anybody wants to know where the title comes from, you can come ask me later. Hey, let's go to Martinique. Where I hear instructions grow on trees. How to walk, how to stand, so that the water pours directly onto your head and none of it splashes on me. I can't keep up with all that inspiration. You float above the long white stairs while I beseech the beach, eyes down. I missed my whole life for the sake of collecting. I saw a rock wear a leather coat. <laughs> A little girl sold me sand. It's true. We're the only ones laughing. Where there aren't any things but your favorites. 
music, and wind. Thanks, everybody. Yay. A few minutes afterwards, if you want to ask any questions of the poets, and uh, but without further ado, except for these people coming in right now. Do we want to turn the air conditioner off, Cynthia? Or did you do that? I think Mary Ellen was cold. Mary Ellen's cold? Oh, she's got the controls right now. Okay. Next, Paul Maziar. And I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay. Is the author of Quick. Millions, full length book, book of poems, just out. Well, probably not just out because I'm copying things I've read that may have been out a few months or more. But published by Cuneiform Press. And he's the author of two books of art writings One Foot in the Other World and Flower Power. I knew that term would make a comeback. <laughs> As well as yes. He's responsible for a handful of poetry chapbooks, including To the Air, a collaboration with the artist Cynthia Lotti, published by Cooley Gallery, New Kind of Neighborhood, a collaboration with Sam Lohman from Great Fainting Spells, and Little Advantages from Couch Press. You can run a press from a couch. He's the proprietor of Breather Editions, which one of which this publication Florian read from, and alongside Aaron Simon, editor of Ergo Press. He writes about art for various publications such as Bomb, Los Angeles Review of Books, Oregon Arts Watch, LA Weekly, and Realism. A book of his art writings, One Foot in the Other World is forthcoming from AC Books and his monograph, Roger Cook's 30 Years, was published in 2019. To the Air, a booklet of his poems in collaboration with the visual artist Cynthia Lotti, was published by the Cooley Gallery at Reed College. Paul Maziar's poetry is a work of vast connections, split-second timing, great energy, and a sense of humor that is deep, but also contains quite serious matters, as the best humor always does. An example, and this is the snippet from the poem. Madame Bonafide slot machine Penny Arcade, if she could pull a Frankenstein on Gertrude Stein, I'd pay $20 for a reading, and here's Jean in the middle of the road between the dome and the rotunda. One could hear the crackling lightning. Maziar's poems include a collage of characters real and imagined amid, at times, the holiest of the blooming desert, where I think blooming claims both its literal and figurative spaces, where we may find ourselves in Maziar's spaces. Please welcome Paul Messier. <laughs> I know, I'm not Paul. Um, so we've been doing this thing when we read together, which has been a lot, um, where we read something that we like of each other's work. So I'm going to read a poem that Paul wrote. So don't get confused. It's coming out of my mouth, but it came out of his head. And it came out of his book. Quick millions, so you know, get yourself a copy now. Okay, it's called Working Days. <laughs> You're making me nervous. A description of the first section of town leads to, like almost everything else, a narrow in the way of a nest. A cheap analogy from newspaper columns, swimming sects, voting booths a procession of discrete, concrete events, the morning coffee enough, to mention the thing itself by circumlocution, 
Grains are, after all, in the feet, sinking coliseums and basilicas, doing the laugh, sorry, oh, doing the talking, cueing the laugh. Thanks to Lorraine for that. Oh, should we mention also, we're going to do our full lens after this. Yeah, no, okay. Okay. You no, don't I need know. to mention it? It's fine. Okay. Um, so thanks for coming, everybody, and thank you so much, Charles and crew, for hosting us. Um, it's been um, a real fun adventure coming from California, um, and uh, Lorraine and I are on a uh, tour. We're on we're on tour. I say we're on tour, dude. Um, with for the celebration of our um, new books from Cuneiform Press, like Charles had said, um, and it's a very long tour that lasts like all year. And we're very lazy about it. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, get a copy of Lorraine's book, The Unwanted Sounds. Um, I'm going to be reading from my book, Quick Millions. And um, um, it's this book is kind of set into two parts. And the first part is um, a part of this body of work that has um, spanned over a decade or so. So I'm going to read some things from that um, period of time. The first thing I'm going to read is from this little chapbook, um, Pneumatics. It's the um, first couple of things. The first one is Nocturne for Charles North. Dare I begin? All my sayings pass by unretained. Knowing what? I know now. Time keeps itself somewhere by a brook. Hearing doesn't mean anything. Can I come in the way the woodwinds do? Won't you please arrange it? I imagine the maestro, but that's not him at all. Sonoris at a time of activity says what I think it means. Now you've nodded off. Music emanates from the nostrils. <laughs> Music emanates from nostrils over the Multnomah village, encouraged by nothing if not an entire set of instincts teased out by DNA, out by the outer band shell, bedtime for someone else. My story. Curious to think, how is it I got here? Not everything is moving, although I think I'm on a kind of train. Scenes leading great surprise. Scenes lending great surprise parachute. The Canadians are polite. It's obvious by their humor they have thought of everything. Dogs are excited by shadows. The French are making up kisses. When I think of locals, when I think of locals, I think of practicing speeches and airs of all kinds that people from New York City trumpet their talk, making sound another space. Taste won't help you understand. But you get it. I like it. A man climbs down because of the pretty woman. I didn't make it up. Just like a song, I end where another begins. Celadon for Larry Fagan. There's a joke, there's a punchline in here you might not get, but um, <laughs> Title of Celadon. Like a lot of people, you follow your nose. I thought I heard what was in your head. It's just a couple of kids playing. Some things growing outside the picture window. Can you see through it? Things seem to be getting better around the country. But it's what they leave out that pleases us. Just like your favorite old books and records. Oh, to be in Paris now that September's there. The baritone encourages you. Settle down, he says. It goes without saying, you bring out the glazes for tea. All his lines are all right. We reprise them in the ruined journey of wind. Celadon, settle down. That's poetry for you. You just gotta let it wash over you like music. You're not gonna, it's not all gonna mean something great, but this poem is called The Great Perhaps. From the moment I prized open the old service door that had been painted shut, I was shown it wasn't Mount Jefferson hung on the wall, but a small patch of pines that wouldn't bend in the wind. Scratches on a chromatic slab, spied on by me, and I heard a crackling inside that picture that hid an actual place. I had been reading The Straw Men in the pantry. A gentlewoman saw them gargantuan. The diners were too starved to wait, so wolfed down bread loaves. It was like yesterday. Harry Quimby was flying over the English Channel. 
projecting headlines in her head. Beauty was too quick for chronology. Cabbies on the ground jostled for fares at the hotels. Particulars of a new year, nice day, a neighbor smiled. So much for that storm. He was a sea captain, but no sea in sight. No public transportation to get there. Mustachioed men in naval attire with small cigars came from everywhere, maritime folk. Till tomorrow, he'd say, walking, looking steadily behind, turning his ribs to see the great perhaps. I'm going to read a couple more of that, you know, era or whatever. This is from Little Advantages. Cheers. To our poor, sick, fun lives. Old Christmas card, still hung on the study sill. Piece of gum stuck to my favorite blue china mug. Tonight, my vision scrapes by. With the animated jerks behind me, 100% we bump glasses to the best night yet. Ostinato. People think I'm tall until I stand up. Part of the scene, mostly the horizon, smiles at me. Using words too much on a hot day, I get fidgety feet. If I were dead, I'd never lie down. I'd be a ghost on the go. Saturday night. Sit down so you don't fall down, my love. It's no fun to get a nosebleed. The man has a claw hidden behind his back. Does he want to hold my cup? It's satisfying to hold a heavy cup. Clink. A window opens. A lady calls out, gesturing, me, <laughs> gesturing circularly below the moon. The man polishes his teeth. These make me laugh, and I don't know why. There are little, there's a lot of like um, uninitiated in, about poetry in the, in the audience, I think. So it's it's good to note something maybe Mary Rose said, which is like I'm a beauty junkie too. Um, it's mostly you know these dream dreamscapes that you wanna that you maybe dream and then you wanna have happen in real life. You wanna see something strange or you wanna produce something strange, like um, a scene from a movie. So. Lorraine, you were talking about like personal in the poetry. You'll get a little personal in these things, but you're kind of going to have to really uh, sit with it and, and feel it um, because these aren't like diary entries or something. So, with that, maybe a couple more from this one. Little advantages. Someone planted the wrong tree during that summer. I had a corridor all to myself. You brought the dominoes into the Belvedere. Years ago, it all changed. I won't go there anymore without your plugs. Now he's always right, she's always right. I can't quite reach them. They're friendly, but they're always falling out into my good ear. I would go without lunch to buy a used paperback. We had one big room with a screen for moving pictures. The spyglass proved good for everybody. You got all the looks. The usher. The usher likes a kind of music with a big dramatic show. Symbols crashing too often for the average listener. Kind of, kind of violin player whose wife catches him in his own house playing secretly in the cellar. Keeps him from her. The sky is the same color at 6 as it is at 10. The usher gets up and puts the coffee on, he makes the bacon, he doses again until 3. People need the sun. Did you know there are pills with sun inside? They don't work on the usher. He takes pills of all kinds. Blue ones, long ones, short ones, fat ones. In the 60s they had the black wonder pill. Winters here are never cold. He's used to the type of weather where you close the door really fast when someone leaves. At the symphony hall, there are 3,000 pound chandeliers. He winds the staircases and drinks from porcelain lime water fountains with little birds all around them. He likes to put sleeves and bow tie, tall slacks and throw attitude around the movie palaces and Italian restaurants. He practices the wink and the coin flip. He's a spaghetti guy. 
you can't take photographs during pictures nowadays. It's all so precious and prefab. You can't stand another day. That came mostly from quotes from this man who I was uh, a waiter for at an Italian restaurant. He'd say all that kind of stuff every night. I was pulling out my notebook and just writing this stuff down. It was insane. Stature. He keeps moving. The trees on the rolling hills look stationary. His hand rises in a fur coat to show the town in conversation. Gatto and Sons, 1935. Freezing salt air to his back. One night away, a song. Black and blue float on the surface down river. He is lonely as someone. The mother of the world has made it this way. He's greeted by her statue. These are intense. This one, I think, is kind of funny. Asshole. Am I funny right there? <laughs> that's pretty good. That, that's not. Thank you, everybody. Asshole. My favorite thing in life. My favorite thing about life is outer space. I see Venus up there. Tomorrow the moon will be full. What did you say? Looks like dead bugs in a dim wall lamp. We had a good laugh when you said that. When you're an asshole, you're always right. And now I'll just read some from um, my new book, Quick Millions. Um, like I said, some of them are from that same period of time. Um, and they're, uh, they're a hoot. Aspects of the poem. Tell me again the story of the chair. A lot of people seem to think I started this business. What brings me back here? It isn't correspondence per se, however the epistle charms. How I look, don't tell me how I feel. Cantaloupe, what's your idea of a good time? Rising to the purest or whatever air. What other creature gets an axiomatic beholder? The answer is, what other creature? Hmm, it smells like caves in this air so sweet like glaze. Everything not chamber music tends toward hysteria, okay? Walking, that does it. There's no need to leave through the crowd yourself. Pull on my coat a bit. Let the four winds blow dark down Strutter's ball. And um, there's a few series, like serial poems in here, and this is one of them. The serial poems are made up of small fragments of a long poem in small fragments. Live. Oh, this t the title is Can't Remember What I Did Tomorrow. Live, you live to a kind of tune. Little musical screamings from the city birds. Streamings, that's what you said. The records come from another time out of their heads. The Iron Age has made this morning warm. Real power. I sum my limbs to strains. To say they're made up dates implies that some are not. I saw that bear driving his brown car out of town, up stars, trying to dream effort. An impactful fish sailing through my mind, the world, the air. It's fine to question, desire, not right, but working between constituents. The organ plays, a rhythm I don't know. But as for the song, it's granted. By way of the occult, you visualize and then can throw a man. This one was dedicated to Kyle Schlesinger, who published Lorraine and I's books. More to do with duration than the number of rooms. A slow place where thoughts like wind aren't collected. They're just there. Swinging screen doors. A place like that. Or maybe a heron, or else a crane. Given the concept of passage and space, the noun works, and it moves after a long while being still. Extant. She caught me on my lunch, fixing a buttonhole. There's not enough time. I must do the work in my head. Out the window, the good news goes. I find no good reason for this life of meaning. In the still of the night, she presses on my jugular. We look up at the tree and wipe away our smiles. 
It's out here. Haunted house. Where our cups on hooks were. The coughing man hung. Upside down, we stood there to try and gain control. Hearts burning with mad fires. We needed a new level. The house had black paintings, white lights, of all things none worse than that floorboard. Bring back the cough. It's a vulnerable business. Upstairs, they still trill you to sleep by footfall. No more visitors today. A lot of the, uh, the dark things in this, these poems are from the, the dark and gloomy Portland years. I don't know if you've got guys have spent much time in the Pacific Northwest for any like long duration. Wow, it, it gets pretty gloomy up there. <laughs> so you're gonna hear some of that if <laughs> they get this stuff. Um, Odds and Ends, another fragmentary poem. When someone you know has always had long hair, when they cut it short, you still see them as having long hair just cut short. They're twins. I like going places, but not the planning part. This way, I get close to nowhere. But when I do go, it's like a new planet. A breadcrumb system begins to take shape, to get into it, the ability to give up and be simple again. Moving on through unforgettable night, motions, a last gas, announcing just how pretty dead yellow grass looks beset by blooming houses. Your nerves burst, magnolia, part by part by part, matching blouse with wainscot. Turned up breezes, I sing the death of false love by doing this. Yes, machines. They made a blaze and set off. Fragrances opened the country. Whatever was behind is now. Keeping the premise, being there, a panacea for work. Maybe now you could take us around in one of your speeding yes machines. Gas it up. <laughs> Again, makes me laugh. Don't know why. <laughs> Emily Greenlee for Lorraine Lupo. That word was like a bell when you said it, beyond opening the front door. Because of my lazy way, I gave in to the rationale, allowing a line of horses to become a lone horizon, moving when the transparency of the support below, given the various trees, placed objects in space, giving on to another layer stripped bare out of nowhere, under an uncommon flicker of attention, I was just waiting around, characteristic of my era, what they call generation, a summoning quality. Summoning. In the end, my dream appeared not to matter, as the cutout of the creature made the night famous in its powers. And so the jaws of the little dog, foregrounding an obvious success, I was reminded waking states don't matter either. Take talking and mimicking, a kind of lifting off, upper and lower again, to, aligned again in navy blue, splitting headache, the problems, but also the advantages of inside, now, outside, And, um, oh yeah, I've got a couple more, just two more. Modernism. I'm looking at an 1889 photograph of a famous painter who fastens his fly as he exits the Lou. The Lou. He's expressionless. A cigarette dangles from his bottom lip. As he crosses the threshold, he passes another man in an identical hat. There will be no exchange with the mystery figure who will not be lifting his head. The painter's fa facial impassiveness belies an abundant inner life. The stranger's posture proposes the dominion of the individual. The zipper will be invented in another century. <laughs> Out now. Tuesday, we went on incidentally. They told me who they were. I was tossed into the air. It worked to my advantage. They knew my story. 
the one that you made up. I'm gonna buy a tackle box, though in a dream I've never seen a fish. A coil, strung bulbs, standing planks for walls, lenses on a swivel, plastic trays stacked, two caps, burns, white blue makes day illusion. Sucking at the air, it's their last day here. They don't want to leave or sit in silence to release constraints. Waves between statements. Jack, in his perfect weather spot, tells Larry, straighten your ass up. Nita hates delphinium because it needs a crutch. All those songs about wearing out your old shoes. Wish we were on horseback. Rhododendrons, scarlet runners, the Bickersons, the local humbirds, as Jack calls them, dive by, a light on the clothesline. He goes, oh, smiling. Sidestepping through wrought iron to hidden garden makes other, better parts appear. Catalpa, tall, dark, and handsome. I step on plums. Two warblers root, a third periscopes midway up an early dogwood. And how? A gold voice in my ear, once imagined. Overcast noon in heat of late Augusto. Arise, she said. Ah, it was something, some, some time, something said. Delirium, relief, leaf in hand, and then aha, as Orpheus says. And the mocking birds go around, not fucking with some new design, to get to one another. No right spot. A one-horse trail with a canopy, fruit landing by the sound of it in the bushes. And I'll close with my um, favorite contemporary writer, Lorraine Lupo, from her book, The Unwanted Sounds. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here to celebrate our book launch and to just be here. So many of my favorite faces in this room. Um, thank you again, Charles, for having us. Klaus. I'm probably the only person to do this, I thought, scrubbing my, my rubber mallet. After a good thumping, I like to display it on my bookshelf. Neon orange. A mini Klaus Oldenburg. Speaking of which, the other night I dreamt he was about to step on the scooping end of a giant shovel and hit himself on the head. Go left, I yelled, and then woke up, which is lucky for him. Oh, wait, stay here. Oh, yeah, we're going to read some of our um, poems that we wrote together. Yeah, I've got that program. Nice. You, you have your... Oh, yeah, it's right okay. there. Okay, so... Um, Paul and I wrote a bunch of poems together that we hope to make into a little chapbook at some point. Um, What's the title? The Lazies, because we're very lazy. Like you were saying, our, yeah. our tour is very lazy. It has months in between each yeah. engagement. Anyway, um, and we wrote the poems over text message, usually trading lines. Um, I think some probably, lot, right? well, no, I think most of the time. Oh. Um, anyway, so. So I'm going to start uh, this one. Oh, so I think we have three poems that were sort of inspired by visual artists. So this one is called Giacometti. Take these sticks. They have no life in them. You've been leaning like a building waiting on a bedtime story. Flies buzz around the obelisk, decaffeinated as they all are. But you need some stimulation. <laughs> a good kick in the panoply when the words shower down remember we've all been dumb animals now get into your lab coat and slip under the door yeah this reminds me that we've been doing these we've been doing this collaboration ongoing for almost six years or something right and it just reminds me of how much fun it is to like to read poetry and to share it among people with other people and um, especially to just like make stuff together and um, I like to say that we are my favorite poet like really and I think um, yeah um, this is called Clay Paul Clay the, the, the artist this is where I stay 
along the dome. The less I do, the more I live, said the kid with the marbles. He rolls them around in his mouth. Alligators are beneath us with slick back hair. This love is warped, dissolving by the afternoon. I grow weary like any other creature. I'm clumsy, so what? Lie down on the road, lie down on the side of the road. Look up at that tightrope. If I go up there, it'll be exactly like being down here. White asparagus. Manet's way was precise from life, like wishes, no bones. So nice, they're nothing like replicas. Very fine, dry lines. No other way around but in the cylinder. It says, keep going. On the last leg, you can rest. So long, Green Street, accommodating pastness with sticks. Sticks? That's the second sticks that we. Is it? Yeah. The sticks are the asparagus. Asparagi? Asparagus? It's not like asparagus, um, but the prognosis. <laughs> <laughs> The prognosis. The repetition. <laughs> sorry. I'm I trying to read this without laughing. Laugh. I told him he was going to laugh and not um, first you. I'm sorry. The repetition seems normal, healthy, like leaves. I was just reading at the bottom of your cup. The vowels are sad, holding down the American conversations, like the last word, an uncut stone in your lovely mind. All nostalgia for when you were sharper. But maybe you never were. Oh, here's another one that's um, inspired by a, 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 a piece of art. It's called Underground Sunday after uh, Warhol. I made it up for money because it enhances my joy. I open this can. Chronology is false. What if there is no end to bananas, oranges, cherries? Must I be happy every day and drawn to certain objects? The faces are Im impassive as you flail on the surf. Angels make their gestures behind your back. It's a nice life as long as you're living, dessert to dessert. The interminable party has an organizing motif. You see it on the hats. The largest of greatnesses is the smallest thing. Oh yeah, we're going to do this one together. This is called Too Nice. I can't close the door without locking it up to the general public. Get the big key from the janitor in from waxing the furniture. He's tired of your fingerprints. He mopes around the corridors after hours in his physiognomy and hat. The people need more people to bump into. It's an accidental night. Any kind of contact will do. Just to clear the air, I bring my fog machine and party favors. The world in miniature obliterates consideration. The lunatic threw away his key ring. Too nice. Oh, yes, yes. The title is Just Do Something. Hold the gravy. Tell the baby. Feed the prisoners. Return the scissors. Bring the myths. Rock the skiff. Loose the dogs. Feed the cogs. Advise the foreman. Leave the Norman. Give the gas. Drop the sass. Pick the apples. Cheat the raffles. Watch the dope. Zap the pope. Ditch the corset. Mind the doorstep. Scream the sneeze. Seize the fleas. Mend the book. Have the luck. Make the shape. Eat the crepe. Pass the salt. Kiss the walt. Have the way. But whatever you do, just do something. OK. That's right. Yeah. Just do yeah, something. It's, that was sometimes Larry. it's hard, but what? That was, quote. That was what our oh. teacher, like our shared teacher would say that. That was his <laughs> biggest Just recommendation. Do Just do something. Um, so we're going to end with some very silly haikus that we wrote together. I'm going to start. We're going to try not okay. to laugh. I know. Excuse me. <laughs> um, where did I put the overture of the tree trunk? Bark, 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 bark. Your hoity-toity underwear made of pasta. Yes, yes, Fusili. 
Late at night I rise, inconsolably weeping. No, I said sweeping. Can you believe it? The Capistrano Swallows stole my little book. I got these sneakers from a peddler in a, on a dune. Great, sand everywhere. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, go on, rock it. <laughs> Stupid, oh my god. <laughs> you can do it, Paul. Well, go on, rock it. That's what you, if you know what's good for you. Wear that Macintosh. <laughs> See, <laughs> Um, the chiropractor says, big wheels keep on turning into the future. <laughs> You're in for it now. The bull is lonely. It's, it's his horn situation. The moon shines on him. I get the dumbest one. I'm on the toilet, dreaming of Casablanca. My head hanging down. On the ship of fools. I address. <laughs> I'm sorry. On the ship of fools. <laughs> I can't read this. Okay, let's do. Let's be done. Okay. I can't read. Okay, that. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Where okay. is it? Where is it? Okay. On the ship of fools, I address the smallest one. Him name is my name. <laughs> Why do you think that's so funny? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody. That question is asked. Why? Why? Yeah. Why this? Why that? Well, um, why do it at all? That's well, what I mean. Because we can. Why. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but also just surprise ourselves and each other. Not that anyone asked. <laughs> Tell me about the continuous poem. Oh, I'm not really because um, I think of continuous as you know, beginning to end and then keep going and stuff. Yeah. But you described it as like a single page, and it could be just that page is all you need. Oh well, I my secret dream is to get get myself connected with a book arts person who could design it so that it would read like you know it wouldn't have to be pages that you turn. Um, I think that would be really cool. Like, but I, it's I, all I can imagine is some sort of like accordion kind of thing. But I'm not a I'm not a book arts person. I'm not a bookmaker. So yeah, anybody out there who's a book arts person, anyway. So, um, but you know, like I don't know if we have been talking about constraints, but um, I the story of starting. I know you didn't ask me. And I'm going to tell you any. The sweet story of starting that was that I was cleaning out my daughter's room when she was like done with middle school age. So maybe you guys have rooms like this, like time to clean them out, too much stuff. And she had thrown like a ream, not a full ream, but like a good amount of just like perfectly good line notebook paper that was not like in the trash. And I was like, what is this? And then it, I just started making notes on it and then I realized like, oh, I, I'm just gonna keep going and fill this entire thing. And, um, and so that's, what that became. Like, it was nice to have a, I really, I like constraints. You don't like them, always. Oh, okay. okay. But I, I feel like sometimes, like giving yourself some sort of um, rule sometimes makes things easier somehow. Um, you know, maybe that says something about my masochism, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway. Well, that can bring a lot of freedom, the constraint, like the To the Air book that you mentioned in the introduction, it was, all the lines are made up of three words, so it's, and then the, they're like um, sonnet structure, but just relative to the lines of the book, the amount of lines. Yeah. But yeah, constraints can be fun because they can actually bring freedom when you think it might uh, block you up from, yeah, thinking of things. If you could boil it down. Oh boy. Boil what down? What is it that you uh, enjoy or appreciate about each other's work? Oh. Oh my God. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> um, I was thinking.
about, I mean, uh, the obvious thing is that we share a sense of humor um, and a sort of sensibility and taste. But what I was really have been appreciating listening to your readings lately, because we have been reading together, is um, you sneak very uh, profound moments in there. Like you're not prepared for the the profound moments, and that's um, that's what's been surprising me lately. Like I'm prepared to laugh, and I'm prepared to like appreciate something quirky happening. But you know. And then there's a lot of beauty. He works on, he's, it's just like there's all kinds of stuff all packed in here. So, yeah. Oh, man, they're sweating right now. Um, <laughs> thanks, Lorraine. Um, I, um, I think it's interesting because Pete, the person asking this question, has been, we've been talking about um, what the poetry that we enjoy and write, what it, what it is and what it's about or something like that, like what characterizes it and these kinds of things. And like, I think for both of us, it's not confessional, personal stuff that we're writing about. It's creating something um, like exterior or noticing something that's really not about us or our, our inner worlds or our stories. But um, the interesting thing is that we can't, as people, we can't help but tell a story. We're st storytelling creatures. And um, the really amazing thing about your writing, about Lorraine's work, is that um, and this is, I think, a really monumental achievement for a poet. Um, it's reading your poems, like there's so much you in there. Not your story, but the feeling that one gets from being around you and knowing you and your, you know, your, the sense of you. It's incredible. It's hard to describe, but when, you, when a poet can get their personality into those lines, um, it's pretty incredible. I don't say the same about you. You can't. I already did. <laughs> That's a nice question, though. Yeah. Give us an opportunity to say things that we want Thanks. to say. Great, great. Maybe we're done. Well, one thing, you know, we have a group here, some of us that create the series have been together for the approaching 30 years. And and so I'm really interested in how poets create communities. And you obviously seem to have a community of two, but, but, <laughs> but maybe there's something much wider and some ideas about what community means to you yeah. and, and how poetry gets to that. That's really cool. And yeah, that's really apropos of our um, knowing each other and becoming friends and collaborating. Um, Larry Fagan was our, our mutual teacher, and um, through working with this, this mentor, um, we got to know each other and a couple of other poets that are now our close friends and people that we um, can like enjoy time together and, and have a laugh and, and have a good meal together, but also we can talk uh, in this sort of language um, that, uh, you know, with a shared kind of perspective about poetry and about art and things like that, and that I think makes the whatever it is, if it's a community, it's like really special and unique. And um, I know that you know those communities very well. Um, and to have people of like minds that you know you also really respect and that um, you admire and you kind of strive to be like in your discipline, you know, that's I think a rare and special thing. Uh, oh. Yeah, oh, uh, go ahead, because I feel like you answered that one. Uh, you mentioned the Quincy observation. Um, I'm curious uh, about the lack of the personal, I would say. Um, it, was that an aesthetic choice? Is that um, part, of a pro part of the project? Part of, is that incorporated an element to the work? Uh, I would, I thought uh, I thought it had a great degree of um, I thought it had a really interesting observational lens, but uh, a little bit of a lack of blood, a little bit uh, you know like in terms of just like a, a little ephemeral, and so uh, but it was it, it but some striking language and in quite an atmosphere and obviously your interpersonal dynamic is captivating because you're very charismatic. So just kind of wondering like what was the, what was the germ? What, what, 
what's, what's the thesis behind the work? Love that. I don't know that I could, like, have ever come up with or would want to come up with a thesis necessarily. Um, I appreciate your critique, most definitely. And it's true, I think it's a good one. Um, because um, setting out to, to make a poem, it never was the case of, I want to tell my story. I think that there's a, a really good form for that. Um, so it was never really my intention to do that. And I started to notice through writing poetry that was kind of um, made up of observations and found lines and um, things that seemed ephemeral on purpose, things that seemed like maybe throwaway or something that was particularly not my own feelings and story and that stuff. The interesting thing that usually happens is that I end up saying something very personal. Um, I think that you might have to sit and read, not, not my work, but something like that in order to like know what I mean, but um, it's, um, once I started noticing that, I was telling myself something, like I couldn't get enough of that sort of uh, dynamic or whatever. Um, and it's, it's an old practice that we're talking like all of 20th century modernism kind of doing work that is supposed to be outside of that, like uh, whatever it is, diaristic thing, or even like with visual art, people wanting to make work that's not representative of landscape or human figures or whatever like that. Um, and it can be evocative of so much more in some cases if it's done well. So that's my, I guess, it, not a thesis, but my hope is that it could like do something that's beyond um, something that might be a little story or a diary entry or a, um, or a memoir, you know what I mean? The, what you just said about Paul's work reminds me of, um, I sent my first chapbook to um, a, a person I worked with in grad school and it was very sweet because he like took the time to read it and then have a meal with me and then he sat me down and he was like, I see this, like it can be clever, it can be this, it can be this, but it's like, where's the blood and guts? Like, and, and I just, I was sort of floored, like I hadn't, I hadn't thought to, it was almost like I forgot about blood and guts. And I think, at least for myself, the reason why I don't, try to go there is that it's really hard to do well. It's sort of like writing a good sex scene. Like, if you can't do it well, then I just want to stay away from it entirely. But it did get me thinking, like, oh, if, if, if I'm shying away from it because it's too difficult or something. I mean, it's just an interesting, maybe the things that we don't want to do every once in a while, we should try doing them and see what, yeah. see what happens. Well, you also reminded me that um, it's a kind of cautionary thing to, uh, like, one should be warned against trying to write personal, emotional poetry because so much of it is done really badly. I think that is... It's easy to do it badly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But then, how can you do it well? That's the question. Yeah, and I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think what you were saying earlier about things popping up, maybe that's your answer, is like, I'm not going to intend, yeah. but like, maybe if I'm, I'm over here in this field, that it's going to pop up somehow. But um, anyway, it gives me nothing. Psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic approaches, like, are, they do that. You're going to you know, go around the thing, and then you're going to tell yourself oh, something uh -huh. about Figure. Thank you. Oh, there's another. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Paul, can you say anything about what's so great about the zipper poem? What's so great about it? The zipper poem. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know what's great about it. I don't. I don't claim. <laughs> Defend yourself. I don't claim great greatness. I don't know if I prefaced that. If I did, I apologize. But there's uh, nothing great uh, about that. Great with the capital G. It's pretty small sheet. Well. Um, that, that poem um, was uh, basically a description, a dumb description of a um, Cartier-Bresson photograph. And it's, um, yeah, it's Matisse in a um, bathroom and he's passing someone and they look, they look really identical because of their hats. And um, I just sat there and I, honestly, I just, I don't know. I, I've been doing like some art criticism writings and things like that and I just, uh, I just sat down and just wrote some thoughts and then it just like happened that way. It's a prose poem, so it's in a paragraph and uh, and I thought that it might be 
curious to note that this period of time um, relative to modern art um, also coincided with, with uh, the invention of something so everyday and like simple as um, and maybe like uh, what, scatological because you know this urine, urinal situation and then the zipper was invented. Um, I don't know if any of that made sense, but it's uh, just a basic little uh, vignette portrait of a picture. For, for me, it's like this guy really liked touch, and then the last line is like, oh, we just dropped into Benjamin's arcade project. Or something. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, the frame really switches. I like it's that. Really simple. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, it's already like the, the two gazes is already great, and then it does something completely different, you know, it's a kind of weird distance, it's kind of breathtaking. So oh, thank you. I'm glad you noticed the um, juxtaposition that, and I'm glad it affected you with surprise because, you know, with this whole question of why write poetry, why do this, it's to create that reaction. And for myself, while doing it too, to make something surprising, which is really hard to do. How do you surprise yourself? Well, you, you put things together that might not fit well, but find connections. And that, that act of finding connections in everyday life is, a really fun thing to try to do. Thank yes. you so much. Yeah. Well, I think we can probably let you guys go. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, so much.